We are so excited to be part of your Wings Over Water Festival this year. Thank you for joining us today. And to the incredible team behind this festival, thank you for having us. We are thrilled. Um, if you guys have questions during the presentation, we'll ask that you type them in the Q&A box below. And uh, Amanda and I will answer them at the end of the presentation. So first, some introductions. My name is Amy Eberling. I'm married to my best friend, Nick, and we have a beautiful seven-year-old daughter named Isla. I spent over a decade bringing science alive as a high school biology teacher. And after experiencing the power of hands-on learning and the ignition of all the senses in the outdoors, the dream and pursuit for an outdoor-based school began. So began the Sal Salish Sea School. I am the founding director and fiercely passionate about cultivating student leaders and marine conservation through unique and purposefully tailored programs that are on or near the water. These programs are designed to bring marine science and research alive in ways that inspire, inspire personal conservation. Seabirds for me were love at first flight. I began to experience the multitude of species that rely on the Salish Sea. And my goal now is to get kids, our local students, excited about these birds and bring them into the bird conservation conversation. So this includes an intense focus and development of a student research project on the endangered tufted puffin population in Washington state. It is my privilege to also introduce you to our co-educator, Amanda Colbert. Amanda lives with her husband in Skagit County and is a kayak enthusiast, hiker, lover of the outdoors and hobbyist photographer. She is also passionate about educating people of all ages about the diverse marine wildlife in the Salish Sea and the importance of providing them safe and healthy habitats. Through obtaining her marine natural certi certification, Amanda was also introduced to this region's avian world. She found a fast love for birds. In the last four years, she's become an avid birder and is learning to identify birds, not just by sight, but by sound as well. Amanda has led boat-based tours around the region for school groups and is on board with us during our student programs and research initiatives. We are so lucky to have her. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here today and listening to this presentation. So not knowing where everyone is visiting from today, I wanna to provide a brief intro and background of the Salish Sea. Many are familiar with the name Puget Sound, but not many have heard the name Salish Sea, even those that live here in our region. 
The Salish Sea includes the north end of the Strait of Georgia and Desolation Sound in Canada, which is up here, south end of Puget Sound in the U.S., and all the way west to the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The name for the Salish Sea was proposed by a marine biologist by the name of Dr. Burt Weber in 1988. This was during a time of growing public concern over bringing super tankers into these inland marine waters. This threat convinced the state and federal government to quantify marine resources among these tanker routes. So scientists from Washington State Department of Ecology began an extensive study of shoreline organisms and NOAA began a marine ecosystem analysis program to describe the ecology of the areas most at risk from an oil spill. The really cool thing is during this study, scientists found an inland sea that was an ecosystem and it wasn't previously described. So the foundation of this ecosystem is the interaction between the fresh water discharges from all the amazing rivers and the salt water coming in from the Pacific. The name the Salish Sea was adopted by the governments of British Columbia and Washington in 2009. This name can now help with international policies and regulations. What happens in Canada affects the same ecosystem and the same organisms in Puget Sound. We are truly all connected. It's important to note the Salish name honors and pays tribute to the Coast Salish people, a group of ethnically and linguistically related indigenous peoples on the Northwest Pacific coast. They're made up of many tribes with distinct cultures and languages. They have been here since time immemorial. They are the first stewards of the area and have a long history of knowledge from hundreds of generations of ancestors about how to best use the resources of this land. Now our school in Anacortes is located on the traditional land of the Samish Indian nation, people past and present. And we honor with gratitude the land itself and the Samish tribe. Now on the right, I really like this animation here. It's such a unique bioregion, truly unlike any other place on earth. It includes all of the watersheds with rivers that flow directly into the sea. You can see the blue water, the fresh water coming in um, into the salt marshes, the wetlands and the bays, and they bring important nutrients collected from the fertile valleys they flow through on their way down. This is why estuaries and in our inland sea is some of the most productive ecosystem in the world. So we're gonna zoom in on this red star here in Anacortes to show you our classroom. So our school, the Salish Sea School is located in Anacortes, Washington. It's a yellow star there. And we are situated halfway between Seattle and Vancouver, BC. It's known as the gateway to the San Juan Islands and it's a perfect location to launch from to explore. You can see from orcas to harbor seals to puffins and river otters and harbor porpoise, most of all of these incredible marine life is just one hour from our launch site. So it was only natural to make this area a classroom. So the Salish Sea School envisions a world where all students are active leaders in protecting their local marine ecosystems from kindergarten all the way up to 12th graders and eventually We'll launch some adult programs. All of our programs include our three pillars, adventure, where we focus on place-based learning, research, where we expose and empower these students to future career options and research opportunities to help local scientists actually collect more data when their resources and time is limited. And this includes the tufted puffins that we're gonna get into. And perhaps the most important uh, part of our mission is to engage students to act for our ocean. So we teach them different ways to be advocates for this marine ecosystem. So we offer a wide range of programs, but it's our flagship student program called Guardians of the Sea that helps with the tufted puffin research that we're gonna tell you about. So we wanna provide you with a quick introduction to this program with a little short video here. Let me make sure I share my sound. Yep. Uh, 
No matter your position or place in life, it is imperative to create opportunities for children so that we can grow up to blow you away. So adults, let's stop thinking of our children as future citizens and instead start valuing them for the citizens they are today. Once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So instead of looking for hope, look for action. Then, and only then, Hope will come. So, a huge part of that mission of that program is to help save. Uh, the endangered tufted puffin population of Washington state. So our programs help do this through the promotion of stewardship of these tufted puffins and the environment they need uh, by increasing public awareness through programs like this and empowering these students as researchers. And this includes data collection at a very remote island called Smith Island. So Smith Island is where that heart is. It's a very remote island and that's why the tufted puffins like it. And there is not much around. I'm gonna prove Amanda's screen here cause she's gonna come back next. Um, so in order to better understand why this population, our state population is declining, it's important to learn more about the life and natural history of this population. So now I'm gonna give uh, the mic over to Amanda to tell us a little bit more about tufted puffins. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, so the first thing that I want to go over with folks again, because we're not sure where you're joining us from or how familiar you are with some of the terminology is the difference between seabird versus marine bird versus pelagic bird. So the terms seabird and marine bird are pretty interchangeable. You'll probably hear both Amy and me use them interchangeably anyway. And they're birds that depend on the marine environment for survival at some point during their lives or during specific seasons of the year. Most seabirds and marine birds are found beyond the intertidal and the surf zone. Now in contrast, pelagic birds are birds that only return to land to nest and breed. So they're otherwise living their full life out over open water. Not all seabirds are pelagic, but all seabirds are especially adapted to the marine environment. So for instance, most have webbed feet for paddling and propulsion, dense waterproof feathers, layers of fat that they're using to protect against cold water, and then bills that are capable of capturing and carrying prey if need be. So pelagic birds especially have this really amazing adaptation where they have desalination glands that remove excess salt from the seawater that they're drinking. And tufted puffins, as you can see in these photos here, display a lot of these different marine adaptations. So they've got these gorgeous webbed feet here. They have also got um, wings that actually act more like paddles when they're under the water. So they can um, steer them underwater. They're also very waterproofed in that manner. And they've got these big bills for carrying large loads of prey when they're heading to their nesting sites. Seabird characteristics overall of which the tufted puffin, puffin would fall into this category. They are longer living birds. They have long lifespans, somewhere between 15 to 60 plus years, depending on the species. They have a delayed sexual maturity, meaning they don't breed immediately. So sometimes this could be delayed two to 10 years before they're actively breeding. They do reproduce annually 
but they do have small clutch sizes, meaning they are likely to only lay between one to three eggs. Our tufted puffin here in the middle in particular is a species that's only laying one egg per breeding season. And then the chicks are going to undergo a long period of development depending on the species. It could be 40 days. There are some that take almost an entire year before they're ready to fledge. As far as puffin species in the entire world, we've got four total, and all of them are gonna be located in the Northern Hemisphere. So I've got range maps here. We'll get to the third one in just a second. But two species are gonna be found along the West Coast up through the Bering and Chukchi Sea. So it's the horned puffin and the tufted here. One species is found in the Northern Atlantic all the way up, up through Greenland's Southwestern coastal area. So they're known as the Atlantic puffin. And then we've got another character that's described as a puffin as well. It's not reflective in the name, um, but the rhinoceros auklet here ranges from the Aleutian Islands where they're breeding down through uh, Baja, California, and this happens seasonally. All four puffin species are pelagic, so they are spending their entire lives out at sea, only coming to land for the purpose of breeding and raising chicks. When they do return to land to nest and breed, they return to the same colony every year, and most colonies are established in really remote places. So places like islands, sea stacks, remote coastal outcroppings, and they do this to keep themselves safe from terrestrial predators. So nesting sites vary a little bit from puffin species to puffin species, but they're usually established either in rocky crevices or in earthen burrows that are dug out so that they have a way to conceal that egg. So to narrow the scope a little bit further, what are tufted puffins in this mix? They are one of 73 seabirds that we are lucky enough to have here in Washington State, but they're also one out of two that are endangered in Washington State. They're typically inland from April to September, and they are also part of a larger um, family. So they're a webbed footed diving bird in the Alcidae family. Other birds in this group that are pictured here are um, the rhinoceros auklet again, our common mirror, pigeon guillemot, and then our marbled murelet as well. And in Washington, puffins begin returning to their nesting colonies about mid-April. Egg laying usually peaks here from May to early June, and then the parents are going to be actively raising and provisioning that chick until they're ready to fledge in about mid-August or early September. And that's typically when all of the puffins return for open ocean, or depart for open ocean, rather. So tufted puffins, I wanted to kind of go over this a little bit. There is a little acronym that a lot of birders and scientists use to um, simplify tufted puffin into tupu. So if you hear us say that as well, we are talking about the same exact thing, our little seabirds here. And to kind of go over some of the bullet points, their height can be between 11 to 12 and a half inches. So they're really not very large birds. Weight wise, 13 to 17 ounces. And then I wanted to talk about coloration a little bit. So males and females are monomorphic, meaning that they look the same, they're developing the same patterns and colors when they're undergoing plumage changes, whether it's transitioning into breeding or out of breeding. So they're typically black with some white, gray. They adapt these um, bright triangular beaks during breeding season that they also begin losing when they're moving out of breeding season. Mostly all puffins do this, honestly. They'll develop that very brightly colored bill and either a whitish face or um, with our rhinoceros auklets, they get these really pretty white ble uh, breeding plumage. Wingspan for these guys is anywhere from 18 and a half to 25 inches. And then some fun facts. So top speeds when they're in flight, these little birds can reach up to about 55 miles per hour. They can stay submerged under the water for roughly two minutes. And then their lifespan in particular is anywhere from 15 to 30 years, but the longest living puffin that was recorded was 36. They're also considered pretty monogamous, so they very rarely change mates. 
and they do go back to nest at those same sites year after year, laying that one egg per breeding season in which they're looking at probably six weeks of incubation and then six weeks of actually rearing the chick before it's ready to fledge. So to point out the places where these colonies are found in Washington state, they're found out along the coast. So it could be anywhere from Nia Bay here at the point downward, but they're also found inland in the interior. So part of the Salish Sea here, and we're gonna talk about that just a little bit. But really what I wanna to talk to you all about first is the historical versus the existing colonies in Washington state. And I'm gonna start off with coastal Washington. So if you check this legend down here, just to the right, you'll notice the differences in size class. Small red dots were recorded with less than 100 tufted puffins. Sites with slightly larger green dots were recorded with less than 1,000. Mid-size orange dots indicate records of 1,000 to just under 10,000 tufted puffins. And then these large purple dots right here indicate an excess of 10,000 tufted puffins at that specific breeding colony. So looking at the coastal Washington maps, map A shows early recordings of breeding colonies from 1886 to 1977. And if you look at it, there's definitely a decently robust number of these colonies in those respective areas. On map B from 1978 to 1984, it appears that some of the dots, while kind of remaining in the same places, um, grew smaller and changed color, which would indicate a drop in individual tufted puffin numbers. But then if you look at map C here from 2007 to 2010, not only is there this large shift in color indicating that colonies are shrinking and so are the individuals, um, but there's this huge drop that has happened altogether indicating that, that we have a disappearance in these colonies. So to transition to the interior Washington, if you're kind of looking in this area, so we've got the San Juan Islands here, Anacortes would be up in this area. The same legend applies for what we're looking at here. So same numbers. And while you can see in map D that even back in 1866 to 1977, there were never numbers recorded above 1000 individuals per colony there were definitely multiple established sites around the San Juan Islands, and then these two remote islands um, called Smith Island and Protection Island. And so if we walk through the same sequence, we're noticing that, you know, as the years are going on, colonies are beginning to shrink or altogether disappearing until the record in 2017 through 2010 only showed these two inland sites uh, left in the Salish Sea, which are at those remote islands, both Smith and Protection. Um, each colony there, however, if you look at the number indicated, shows that there are less than 100 individuals that are breeding there. So to kind of simplify and sum it up, if we were looking at the early 1900s across both coastal and interior, there were 44 active colonies between both. From 1978 to 84, there was a loss of nine, leaving 39 or 35 um, active colonies between the coast and the interior sea. And then from 20, uh, 2007 to 2010, we had another significant loss of 16 colonies overall, bringing the overall number of active sites down to 19. So numeric wise in the early 1900s, there was estimated to be roughly 25,000 tufted puffins. And that first drop that we experienced reduced the Washington state number by roughly 2,000, leaving us 23,000 individuals. But the most significant drop happened um, after that 1984 survey, so between 2007 and 2010, and it has left the state an estimated 2,950 tufted puffins from the coast to the interior. And what this basically means is that 90% of the population around Washington state has declined here. It's at a current annual rate of about 8.9%. And if that annual rate were to continue, the state's population could become functionally extirpated within 40 years, meaning we would not have tufted puffins in Washington state any longer. And sadly, given that um, the rate of recent population decreases and widespread colony abandon abandonment, there are ongoing threats from multiple factors, um, challenging ocean conditions, and all of these things are uh, continually expected to harm the overall seabird population in the years ahead, which includes the tufted puffin. 
So I'm going to turn it back over to Amy briefly to talk about um, what we're doing about all that. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, so uh, the Tuft of Puffins, I'm going to tell you a little bit about their endangerment listing. So in 1990, the Washington Wildlife Commission adopted a listing procedure um, it's developed by a group of citizens, interest groups, and state and federal agencies. And it basically included how species listings will be initiated, criteria for listing and delisting, public review standards, and the development of recovery or management plans, and then periodic reviews of the listed species. So before this, there was no conservation status nor legal protections for tufted puffins. Um, so in 2014, 2015, the first step in the process was to develop this preliminary species status report. And the report includes a review of information relevant to the species status in Washington. It addresses factors affecting uh, the tufted puffin status. And then there's a public comment period. And then the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife prepares a final status report and listing recommendation for presentation to the Washington Fish and Wildlife Commission. So I do want to um, shout out to these amazing scientists and all the contributors that participated in this status report and recovery plan for really helping these puffins get this status, this listing here. So tufted puffins were designated as a candidate for state listing in October of 1998. And then the tufted puffin was state listed as endangered, endangered in April 2015. So what does endangered mean? Well, of course, um, the definition, species native to the state of Washington that's seriously threatened with extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range within its state. So what does this listing do for them? Well, it provides more resource, resources for research and recovery efforts. It allows for increased public awareness with the listing and also critical habitat designation. So after this listing, um, there is a, the procedures mentioned for the status report required a preparation of a recovery plan. How can we recover this population? Um, and this is true for all endangered species. Recovery plans set specific recovery goals and objectives and establish an implementation plan to reach them. Criteria for reclassification are delineated as for priorities for research, education, restoration, and other relevant topics. It provides an update to the status of tufted puffins in Washington and prescribes strategies to recover the species and target population objectives for downlisting them to straight th uh, state threatened and then sensitive status. So recovery as defined by the US Fish and Wildlife Service is the process by which the decline of endangered or threatened species is arrested or reversed and threats to its survival are neutralized so that its long-term survival in nature can be ensured. So what's this mean for Washington tufted puffins? Well, in 2017, the minimum outer co coast population was around 1,278, so 1,278, well below the threshold recommended for long-term viability. To downlist puffins to threatened, a minimum viable population size of 4,500 individuals are needed. And then a targeted population of about 7,500 would downlist them to sensitive. So we have a, a long way to go here. Now, this is the range of tufted puffins here. And you can see that, well, I'll show you, the concern is not limited to Washington. Japan also has them listed as endangered since 1993. Um, Environment Canada included puffins as a priority species in its North Pacific Rainforest Bird Conservation Strategy, and the government of BC increased their conservation status of breeding populations from vulnerable to imperiled, impaired, imperiled in 2015. Breeding populations in Oregon's are con Oregon are considered critically imperiled, and then uh, considered species of concern for California. So because their natural history is, is relatively well known, tufted puffins can actually signal, signal deeper ecological patterns through subtle changes in their diet, behavior, and breeding success. So feeding high on the food chain provides a visible means for gauging a range of trends from plankton productivity to ocean warming to climate change. So Amanda is going to tell us a few mm -hmm. hypotheses that scientists have come up with and reasons for their decline. 
Yeah, so um, really right now it's unknown which of the following threats is the main downfall of tufted puffin numbers in Washington state, but rather it's pretty likely that a number of the historical and recent factors has contributed to pretty much a complex challenge for survival for these birds. But the first one that we've noted here is habitat loss and introduced species. And so basically what has happened with this is human disturbance um, on these breeding colonies, whether it's through development or introduction of species such as rabbits, as you can see here, along their remote breeding areas have created competition, caused habitat destruction and disturbance. And most of the times that's the first cause for abandonment. So in the photos that we've provided here, it's kind of a comparison um, rabbits also burrow in a very similar manner that the tufted puffins do, um, but in larger numbers, they are drastically changing the landscape, as you can see here. The second cause of decline to bring to your attention is declining prey availability. And tufted puffins are not the only seabird or really the only marine mammal, for that matter, that rely on healthy and abundant populations of forage fish. So they're looking for things like sand lance, herring, surf smelt, um, and the overall decline of their prey and the competition for this prey resource is a big factor in tufted puffin survivability and abundance. So what's happening to these forage fish? So shoreline armoring is a big thing that we bring up. Many forage fish species spawn on beaches and in the near shore tidal zone along the coast and in coastal areas around the Salish Sea. But what happens when we develop along the shorelines um, and erosion occurs or water levels begin to rise? There's uh, usually a call to armor the shoreline as you can see here in the photos with some type of material, be it a wall um, that will keep the beach from washing away and protect against water level rise or rough weather conditions. Um, when we begin to armor the shorelines, really what we're doing is we're removing the beaches and near shore that forage fish depend upon. So if you look at this graph here, very clearly shows surf smelt and sand lance breeding areas where they are depositing those eggs. Herring are also kind of um, in this intertidal zone here, but in two different areas. So when that water is receding, this part of the beach is exposed. When the water comes in, it's high enough for these small forage fish to get in and lay their eggs. So to help show you what I mean about how shoreline armoring is eliminating this area that's needed for forage fish, uh, we can look at the first two boxes on my screen and talk about what it looks like in a natural unarmored shoreline. So the water levels are going to be able to fluctuate with the tides normally. And even as tides are increasing and water levels are increasing over time with projected climate change, without anything here to armor off or uh, change the shoreline, that water is gonna flow freely. And what's really gonna happen is the beach is gonna naturally expand. Forge fish still have the ability to access this part of the beach. But if we get into what an armored shoreline looks like uh, in these next two frames, we've introduced a seawall or an armored area right here. And so in this photo right here, the beach area can still be exposed at lower tides, but it's a lot less of an area than we saw in the first two um, graphs up here. Now, as water level rises and it's going to increase along that armored shoreline right there, it's actually going to just basically eliminate the beach altogether, meaning that beach will never be exposed and it will be a loss from forage fish for breeding purposes. So now this is just some open water out here that's inaccessible for what they need um, to deposit those eggs. So pollution and contaminants are another large um, issue, especially here in the Salish Sea. Um, one of the greatest sources of contaminants is stormwater runoff. And stormwater runoff originates basically during a precipitation event. So that's either through rain or snow melt. And the rain or the snow melt can be held on the surface and evaporate. Um, it can soak down into the soil. It can run off through storm drains, retention ponds, and directly into waterways, finding its way into creeks, streams, rivers, and all of those which are eventually going to lead to the Salish Sea. And stormwater runoff consists of a lot of different things. There's inorganic and organic garbage. There's plastics, both large and micro, 
pesticides, fertilizer, oil and grease, gasoline, uh, metals and copper from rusting vehicles and brakes, sediment from construction sites that contain paint, lead, adhesives, toxics, and other urban materials, as well as even nutrient waste from pet feces. So the important thing about all of this is to note that most of the stormwater does not go through a wastewater treatment plant. So none of these pollutants are being removed before they're reaching the Salish Sea. And the effects of the pollutants start at the bottom of the food chain, but they magnify as they work their way up to those that eat higher. So they, uh, those pollution amounts can be found in larger amounts in our seabirds. Fisher bycatch is another big one and it's actually started historically for the tufted puffins. Um, they were a major portion of bycatch on large-scale drift net fisheries in the North Pacific and tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of seabirds are killed annually. Um, they were banned by international treaty since 1991 but there still is some illegal drift netting that continues in the north with undocumented levels of seabird bycatch, and that's mostly because of how far offshore these fishing practices take place. Coastal gillnet fisheries are also something that impacts puffin populations. And it's important to note too, you know, this problem is known. There are numerous organizations and companies that are trying to work on fishing gear and equipment. Um, they want to reduce bycatch altogether, but it's likely that it is still a threat for our tufted puffins, especially when they make their way out into the open ocean. Recovery of avian predators, predators is another thing for our tufted puffins. So the pressures of bald eagle predation on tufted puffins were subdued for a time when DDT was making it nearly impossible for bald eagles to successfully lay and hatch eggs. But when DDT was banned back in 1972, bald eagles began recovering and they made a full recovery basically in 2007. So as a top predator for the tufted puffins that are now lower in number than they were back in 1970s, these predators far outweigh prey in this scenario, which can prove troublesome to tufted puffins. And around Smith Island, where we do uh, most of our surveying, we've seen two separate nesting pairs of eagles just above where the tupus burrow um, and are located. And we've seen both balds and tufted puffins present at the same time throughout the summer. So we're actually able to kind of see that threat as it's possibly occurring. It's important to note too that some of the threats that we just went over are just a few of many really. Um, oil spills, worsening ocean conditions, and climate change are just a few more to add to what feels like an ever-growing list for these seabirds. And so we want to go into how the Salish Sea School is relating to tufted puffins and what we're actively doing about the so we've got a quick video which introduces Dr. Peter Hodum. He's a conservation biologist studying tufted puffins, and he's partnered with our school to help develop research and data methods for us and our students to go collect the important information necessary to help further their research, figure out these underlying problems, and what possible solutions there can be for these awesome little seabirds. Hi, my name is Amy. I'm the executive director and teacher for the Salish Sea School. Part of our mission is to introduce our students to the incredible marine life that depends on the Salish Sea. We then empower them as citizen scientists to help collect valuable data that aids the great work our local scientists are accomplishing. Today we want to introduce you to one of our partner scientists, Dr. Peter Hodum. Peter is a conservation biologist and professor at University of Puget Sound who is fiercely passionate about seabirds. He has graciously given his time on our scientific advisory board and designed a tufted puffin protocol and survey just for our school and our students. We are so excited to introduce you to Peter and share his important work with you. 
Hi students, my name is Peter Hodum. I'm a conservation biologist and a professor at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. I'm really excited for all of you. You're gonna get out on the water, you're gonna see one of my favorite seabirds, tufted puffins, and you're gonna get out to one of the few places left in the entire Salish Sea where tufted puffins still breed. You're gonna be seeing tufted puffins in all their glory, in their beautiful breeding plumage, returning to the colony to take care of their chick. And in fact, when they're not tied to the breeding colony, they spend the rest of the year on the open ocean. So during the winter months, they migrate out of the Salish Sea completely and out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We still don't even know where they spend their winters. They used to be a lot more common in the Salish Sea and actually throughout the waters of Washington, but they've declined significantly over the last few decades and they are now listed as endangered by the state of Washington. And what does that actually do for the species? Well, one, it gives the species legal protection, which is very important. It also helps raise the visibility of tufted puffins. So it helps organizations recognize that this is a species that's a priority that really needs our efforts, our energy, and our resources. So it helps us raise money to, to support uh, conservation and restoration efforts for the species, to do research and monitoring to see how the species is doing over time, and to do things like this, which is to invite students of all ages to get involved in the work to help tr to conserve the species. One of the big challenges is that we don't really know very well yet why they're declining. And it's really hard to do meaningful conservation if you don't know what's driving the populations to decline over time. And that's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to learn and figure out what's going on with them so that we can actually do that meaningful conservation. And this is where we really need your help. And working with the Sailor Sea School, I've helped develop methods that you will be using out on the water to help us collect information that will contribute to our understanding of tufted puffins and their conservation in the Salish Sea. Thank you very much for collecting this invaluable information about tufted puffins. I'm excited to see the information that you collect and I look forward to, keep, to continue working with you in the future. Peter, thank you. All right, so you can see that we are helping with some of these top priority uh, action items from the recovery plan and working with some of the scientists that actually helped develop that plan. Um, so what we are doing as a Sailor Sea School for the endangered tufted puffin population in Washington is helping with boat-based surveys at Smith Island. So we're helping to fill in the data gap. Down here you can see this is from the report of when they counted the puffin colonies and the breeding pairs. Their high number at Smith Island was at 28. This past summer, Amanda, I think, uh, found 24 of them on one boat ride. So we're documenting the amount of puffins that we see when we go to Smith Island and also their behavior. And so when I talk about behavior, I'm, I'm talking about their prey. And so if they have prey in bill, we document that, and that can help us two ways. One way that can help us identify that they have a chick, because scientists believe they feed themselves underneath the water. If they have prey in their bill, they're taking that food back to a chick. So we can hope that a chick is born if we see a puffin with prey in the bill. We also are able to hopefully snap some shots of a closer look of the fish, like here, and identify the food that these puffins are using or eating that they rely on. And then we can help observe that uh, fish, the forage fish population. We also help record uh, plumage transformation. So as Amanda said earlier, the puffins start in this brilliant, uh, very dramatic plumage, and they transform just like the leaves in early fall, and they lose the tufts and, and the outer bill. Um, 
mirror in their head turns black again. And so this is important data at Smith Island. When are they changing into their plumage? What does it look like? Um, is it changing year to year based on environmental conditions? We are also trying to bring a greater public awareness to the Tutpoot population in Washington. A lot of people don't even know that we have them here because they are at such remote locations. So during our program, we teach students about factors of their decline, like Amanda went over, um, including the forage fish. We provide ways everyone can help. So our local team in town here, our aquatic reserves does a forage fish survey. And so students will go out and help survey the eggs at our local um, Fidalgo Bay. We also help um, to teach students about contaminant uh, reduction, mitigating climate change, and all the other factors that are affecting the puffin population. So how else are we helping? We try to get these students excited from a very early age about birds. That's one thing we're hugely passionate about and in including tufted puffins in that conversation. So we have a shoreline exploration adventures program for our younger students where we observe migratory birds, we talk about puffins and then how they can help from that age with the population. Peter Hodum is also helping us with an annual marine bird survey. So since we're already on the water, we decided to create GPS points. And every month we go out to these predetermined GPS transects and do a stationary circular radius point count, which basically means you stop the boat and you count the birds around you. And we do this monthly. So our goal is to continue observing these spots. They're both random and observed as special areas for different species. And we'll do this throughout the year to help populate even more data on these important seabirds. And on the right here, you can see another endangered bird we have here in Washington, the marbled merlet. Now, you might be wondering how you can help. So if you're inspired to help our school, we have a wide range of opportunities available. So the first thing that we're so excited to launch is our Adopt a Puffin program. It's launching today. And we are custom designing a tufted puffin that's stuffed and his name is Tough Puff. So we're just trying to make it very complicated for you to say, but our students out on the water with us named, when they saw Tufted Puffins, they really liked the name Tough Puff. So they named him, so we thought it was fitting, what well, could be her, um, to name our first stuffed animal Tough Puff. This will be a limited edition. We'll have other ones with different names that the students name through the years. Um, but it's really cool because we designed his bill or her bill after the puffin that we saw. So the adoption will come with one stuffed tough puff, an adoption certificate, a puffin protector sticker, and a wild picture Amanda took of actual tough puff, the tufted puffin, that um, from this past summer at Smith Island. So a contribution to this program supports tufted puffin research in Washington. It continues to help our education programs and advocacy. Um, just do note these aren't ready to ship yet. So pre-order is open now because we have limited quantities. We wanted to offer it to you guys first. They'll be ready to ship probably in late spring. Other ways you can help include simply subscribing to our newsletters on our website, uh, volunteering for us if you're in the area or even if you're not. We actually really love volunteers that enter data into our Google Drives. Uh, you can follow us on social media, Instagram and Facebook see what we're up to. We post all the pictures from our programs of our students and summer programs and Tufted Puffins that we see. Another simple way you can help is if you are in the area, if you go out on a bird ship trip um, in Washington or even a pelagic Washington bird trip, we are next attempting to identify individual Tufted Puffins and also looking at are they using any new breeding areas that we aren't accounting for. So if you ever take a picture um, please notate the GPS coordinates where you are. Send a picture um, to the email listed there, amy at the Salish Sea School org. And as a nonprofit, we rely on our community. We call it our village. It truly takes one. And a cornerstone of our mission is to make our programs affordable and accessible to all students through our scholarship program getting all students on board with us. So we invite you to watch one final video here today before we take questions.
the Salish Sea, an incredibly diverse marine ecosystem where beauty abounds. Yet the decline of the ecosystem is outpacing recovery. The Salish Sea School is on an endless pursuit to cultivate a community of student leaders to restore health to the marine ecosystems. To connect all students to the remarkable classroom right outside their doorsteps. To provide transformational outdoor experiences that reconnect students with nature that empower students as researchers, that engage students to act on behalf of all forms of life in the sea. None of this would be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. Because of you, we've given over $12,000 in scholarships in just our first year. Without these resources, nearly 80% of students would not have been inspired by the programs of the Salish Sea School. And for these gifts, we say a very heartfelt thank you. So I'm going to invite Amanda um, back up to help with the Q&A. If anyone has any questions or comments or anything else, uh, Amanda will guide us through. Yeah, so we have one so far. Um, and the question is, is it true that in Iceland people eat Atlantic puffins? Now, from my understanding, it's not really a native um, thing in Iceland, but I have heard that tourists can go over to certain restaurants in uh, the Reykjavik area and ask for tufted puffin. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how they acquire it. I don't know if it's, uh, <laughs> um, if it's like a, a cultural thing, if it's something that they just feel is very exotic to offer someone who's traveling to their country. Um, but I have read multiple testimonies from folks that have uh, grown up there, fished there, lived there that said that they've never tried it before. So I'm not really sure um, anything more about it. I would have to Google more. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, Amy. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I know they used to. I think um, even the great puffin, I think, went extinct because of that. The great, was that its name? The large one there. Um, so any more, I don't know the answer to that. I do, I do know a lot of people <laughs> used to do it. So I don't know at all. I know they were very successful in recovering an Atlantic puffin colony. I don't know how the Atlantic puffin population is doing in Iceland, but I sure it'd be crazy if they were allowed to eat them if they're not doing well. Yeah, and somebody just included some information in the chat. It says, Icelanders also, according to legend, sometimes eat the friendly seabird puffin. Visitors can actually order them in many tourist restaurants in Reykjavik, usually smoked to taste almost like pastrami or boiled in hmm. lumps resembling liver. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, oh. every day. <laughs> um, well, thank you, uh, Frederick, for providing that. And then let me see. Another question was, were there towers on Smith Island? Yes. And I believe there used to be a lighthouse. So there's a house. Um, I, I could reshare the picture. There a house there now. Um, but I think primarily it's used now for Navy stuff. And unfortunately, Smith Island actually is part of the, um, the underwater testing MOA or whatever it's called for submarines. That's kind of another thing we're, we're eyeing to work on in the advocacy action because a lot of people aren't familiar with the Tufted Puffins. It doesn't come up in conversation as much with these, these target items. 
Definitely. All right, and this question from Ellen and Dave are what regulations are in place to protect tufted puffins from boating visitors uh, like the orcas? And that's a really great question, which I can take if you want me to. Sure. So um, as far as the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act goes, and I know as far as some of the laws go for um, your approach to wild animals, the standard to um, try to mitigate harassment or behavior changes or anything that could possibly stress the animal out is a uh, hundred yards is typically what you're supposed to stay. So about a football field. Um, there is nothing right now. In fact, there's not a lot of anything right now written in for tufted puffins. They have this amazing recovery plan. Um, but they don't really have the resources and they don't know enough about some of the threats to know what comes next. Um, so that's definitely something that in those remote places, especially when we're out, we actually haven't really crossed too many people that are approaching Smith or Minor Island for that matter. So they're right next to each other. Um, it seems more so that they're either going out past possibly for fishing or people are recreating closer to the Whidbey Island side of shore. Um, now that's just our observations. That's definitely not, um, you know, law by any means. Um, we're not out there all the time, so we don't know what occurs out there all the time. But I haven't really heard of um, boating behavior really being a problem for the tufted puffins, especially out along Smith and Protection. But Amy, you can correct me if you have. Yeah, so currently there's no protections um, boating-wise for them, and I think part of the reason is the population goes to these remote places that people are not even aware that they're there. Um, the puffins typically stay far away from anyone, whether they dive or fly. Um, but, you know, our Amanda's counted 24 one day, but our average count was seven tufted puffins. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very unlikely for boaters to come across these tufted puffins um, inland. No, I don't know how pelagic um, out in the ocean what happens with the fishing boats and, and everything. But no, nothing right now. Um, and that's what we're working to figure out and help help find out if it's necessary. Just as an aside too, so I shoot with a telephoto lens, which gives me plenty of space. And one of the reasons that I picked it up was so that we could get some closer ranged photos without having to specifically disturb what it is we're trying to um, photograph. We have had a couple times where we're, you know, perusing through the area and they've popped up right next to the boat by, you know, a couple yards. And typically at that point, if our boat is shut down and the motor is shut down, we've talked with the kids about proper boating etiquette around wildlife, but we've also talked about proper behavior in close range, meaning, you know, no jumping around and creating an echo in the hull that could scare. Um, we don't want any of these birds exerting more energy than they have to while they're out there. Um, so they are really well prepped to be able to go out and view. And we know, you know, as with anything, wild animals can pop up at any time or show up at any time. But we are actively letting the kids know, you know, for as much as we want to help the puffins, we definitely don't want to contribute to any of their downfall. So we are doing what we can to kind of minimize our impact while we're out around Smith Island as well. And so another question that came up was, what special markings do we use to identify specific puffins? Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, the short answer is we have no idea. The long, <laughs> the long <laughs> well, we are, the long answer is we are trying to figure out um, based on their bill lines, which change annually, so that makes it difficult, and bill shape. And then um, this next summer, we're going to go out and try to get different angles um, we're going to tell them to pose at different angles for us <laughs> and we're going to try to figure, um, figure it out. So that's the goal here. No scientists so far, we've asked the scientists study them, studying them and they haven't been able to figure it out, but it would be very valuable to know if the same puffins are returning or not, if they're going elsewhere, um, et cetera. I did say, see, we have five minutes left. So I think we're ending at two, not two fifteen. Okay. Um, the two poo diminishing at haystock rock, haystack rock and organ. I believe that population is declining. I mean, I don't know if you have any. 
you know, I took a trip down there a couple of years ago and they had a really great organization out with a big van. They bring spotting scopes so that at low tide, I think they call it Friends of Haystack Rock, if I'm not mistaken. And I want to say that when I spoke with the naturalist on board that they were saying that they were seeing a decline, but they are still actively colonized and nesting there. I saw way more other species of seabirds than I saw tufted puffins. So I don't know what that mark in decline would be. Um, we'd have to probably do some digging into if Oregon's keeping track of any of uh, the numbers down there, but that's a really good area to mention. Can I, can I just break in really quick? I just want to tell you that you do have till 2.15. So if you have more questions oh. to take, please, we are, I'm enjoying this very much. So I don't want you to end it any sooner than you have to, please. Oh, good. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Debbie. So far, I think we've gone over. So I see two new ones here. Oh. Okay, and I'm in the chat. So if you're in the Q&A. Yeah. So okay. has a tupu ever been banded for study in migration patterns? And then the next one, is there a banding program for monitoring the Salish Sea Puffins? Um, so what I know is Sea Doc Society has banded one puffin, and I think they tried to, <laughs> to ban more, but it was a difficult task. Um, and there's actually a great video on it, uh, Salish Sea Wild, I think is what it's called, Tufted Puffin Edition, that shows him holding... Joe Gatos, the puffin. Um, I think that happened last summer. And so if not last summer or the summer before, I I'm not sure. Summer before. I'm not sure um, if it ended up coming back. So I know of one on the that happened inland. Coastal, I'm not sure. Amanda, do you know? I don't. And I know from that video and Joe kind of talking about it, that it is a hard process because there's not a really great way to capture them other than going out and trying to like scoop them up in a net, which really, you know, stresses the animal out profoundly. Um, a lot of birds that get tagged most times, you know, researchers can get in when they're fledglings or when they're juveniles and find a way to get that done. But because, you know, the puffins are all kind of colonized in the same place I think it would be like a huge disturbance for somebody to try to get on shore and to know when to even go there to see if there's a fledgling or a chick worth band uh, banding and then they just leave and go straight for open ocean. Um, we really wanted to see if we could um, detect any of them leaving burrows and heading for open ocean or even sitting on the water just beneath the burrows at Smith this last year. And we haven't seen it. And as far as I know, a lot of other naturalists out here um, that have been on the water for years have not had the opportunity to see it either. So I understand it's a pretty rare occurrence, um, but one that, you know, we hope we get lucky enough to possibly see at some point. So I think it's just kind of problematic. And with the population being so low, is it worth the stress of tagging for some of that information um, I don't know about resources for that either. I imagine Peter hasn't done that out at protection either. I think he was part of that initiative with CDOC. Oh, for banding? Yeah. Okay. So the other thing is tufted puffins are so sensitive that I think um, I read in a scientific journal that they, will, they are known to leave their breeding colonies if there's human disturbance on the island. And so I think that's another um, benefit first risk of that no that's a great question so yeah, how so the, oh do you have another one how did bunnies get on smith island so that's a really good question so they're out along san juan island as well and um the, I don't know about the specific species on smith but i would imagine it probably runs in the same vein um, there were European rabbits brought over and it was for hunting purposes. So we have another island up in the San Juans that was actually stocked with a couple different um, deer and sheep that are not native to this area. And it was specifically at one point for folks that enjoyed hunting as a sport. Um, now they've kind of, you know, rabbits multiply very quickly and they have very much overrun certain areas out along those islands. So there is talk about trying to find um, a mitigation plan to hopefully help not even just reduce, but actually eliminate, you know, which is a sensitive subject as well. Um, but they are, uh, they are 
changing the landscape in which, you know, these native species depend upon for breeding purposes. So it's a touchy subject, but it's definitely um, an important one. Um, I wanted to hop on before the, the last or the next question here. So these are all pictures we took. Can you guys see this? Okay. Yeah. Or Amanda, can you see? Mm -hmm. um, of the puffins this past summer. And so our goal is we're writing down um, bill shape. And so just you asked about how, did, how we ID individuals or how we are trying to ID individuals. We are comparing the bill creases. And it's really easy to tell individuals apart when they start looking different um, in the winter time. But our goal is to keep this bill shape pictures and to go through the same exact one. We think we've matched one or two of them for sure, but next summer it's going to be important um, to get those good pictures and see if we can get returning chapter puffins, which is very non-invasive, you know, much better than, than the banding program for sure. So we have a folder here full of our, all these amazing photographs that Amanda has taken with her huge lens. Um, and... I'll see if I can show you a difference here. So this guy, I call the godfather because he just looks like just old and <laughs> just like he owns the place. And so his bill lines, if I thought about this sooner, I would have um, put this on a PowerPoint. But if you can look at his bill lines there, he has one, two, three, four, the little one right there. And this one's going to look a little different. So... Uh, they do change. We think they change each year, but you can see the bill lines are different for each one. But this was the only one. Thank you. 